Hello everybody and thank you for joining us today. I'm Salim Khan, the India Director for the British Asian Trust. And it's my absolute honor to be hosting and moderating this session today to discuss and deliberate the role that blended finance and more specifically the role of CSR capital and family offices will play in helping solve some of the longer term development challenges for India and help del deliver its SDG goals. Over the last six years, India has witnessed a robust growth of blended finance instruments and been a sandbox of innovation in this space. According to Convergence, approximately 13% of all blended finance transactions were deployed in India, particularly in sectors such as skills, education, and healthcare. Blended finance approaches that make strategic use of philanthropic and public funds to mobilize private capital to achieve development outcomes have globally mobilized approximately $161 billion in capital towards sustainable development in developing countries to date. While several types of instruments such as debt-based structures and impact bonds have been trialed, these tools have been primarily driven by philanthropic organizations or private investors. There is therefore a critical need to expand the funding pool and include new stakeholders for financing development work. The CSR on the other hand, provides an additional funding pool of almost $7 billion over the years towards meeting SDG goals. In addition, to, in, addition in 2020, family philanthropy tripled its corpus to US dollars 1.6 billion and is estimated to grow even further with the boom in ultra high net worth families in India and their increasing interest in deploying capital to fund social causes. To help this discussion, we are extremely happy to have an absolutely brilliant panel with us today, a mix of CSR leaders, uh, representatives of financial services institutions, family offices, and blended finance experts who come with a very strong global perspective. Uh, let me just take a few minutes for a very quick introduction to our panelists. I want to start with Akif Merchant. Akif is an associate director at the Convergence, the global network for blended finance, where he's responsible for clients from across the public, private, to philanthropic sectors with capacity building and advisory support. Uh, thank you very much, Akif, for joining us today. Uh, our second panelist is Mr. Ashwini Saxena. He's just joining in. There are some technical glitches and he'll be with us soon. Uh, Ashwini Saxena is the CEO of JSW Foundation, one of country's largest private foundations with a portfolio spanning across education, skills, WASH, healthcare, and, and, and many other sectors. And are, it's a pleasure to have Mr. Mr. Saxena with us today. Uh, it's great to have Soumya Rajan, founder and CEO of Waterfield Advisors with us today. Soumya brings with her more than 26 years of financial services experience. She has advised several of India's leading business families on issues related to success and continuity of their family enterprise, including managing their family investments, succession transitions, mentoring the next gen, corporate and family governance, conflict resolution, business strategy, and philanthropy. Thank you so much, Soumya, for making time to join us today. In a high question, check. And finally, we're not working. Please check your connection or use a different speaker. Okay. Can you hear me? And finally, we are very happy to have Neha Bharadwaj from Bank of America with us today. Neha heads the ESG function at the Bank Bank of America in India. In her current role, she's responsible for driving the bank's ESG strategy and managing social investments in the country. Uh, before we start, I'd like to invite Akif to, to, to just set some context. Uh, uh, you know, just get defining blended finance for us, how does it compare to other forms of funding, the overall mo market opportunity size, some global examples of blended finance structures, and if we, if we look to then apply some of them to India, then how CSR and family offices can participate in, in this opportunity. So Akif, can I invite you for, for a quick context setting, you know, so that that then sets a good stage for us for our discussion forward. Great, thanks, Salim. Uh, can you all hear me and see me? Yes, we can. Great, fantastic. So 
Good morning to all of you from here in Toronto. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank uh, the British Asian Trust uh, and Sankalp for bringing us all together uh, to discuss this very important topic. And the fact that I heard we have around 130 people signed up for this session, I think is a testament uh, to the curiosity um, uh, around this particular theme and this particular uh, topic. So we'll spend the next few minutes um, with some context and scene setting for the discussion to follow. We'll speak about the definition of blended finance, some key features uh, of, of this particular uh, structuring approach, uh, and we'll go through some data uh, with respect to the Indian context. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I think it's very important before we start to go back to first principles and really define what we're speaking about. Uh, so what is blended finance? Uh, so blended finance is essentially the use of development funding from public and or philanthropic sources, and this could include even indeed uh, CSR sources or from the family office side, family office philanthropic sources. Um, and these development funding are deployed on concessional terms or non-market terms or asymmetrical terms with the express intent and purpose of mobilizing private capital, which is sitting on the sidelines, on market terms or on market rates into blended finance structures um, that are SDG aligned um, in frontier and emerging markets. So that's essentially the idea around blended finance, the use of development funding to mobilize private capital into transactions that they would not have been able to uh, go into otherwise. Next slide, please. Um, so what are some key characteristics uh, of a blended finance transaction? Uh, number one is leverage. The whole idea and principle around blending uh, is to mobilize additional private capital. Uh, and that's why you need to have leverage, which is essentially the idea of mobilizing private capital on the backs of each dollar of concessional capital within a transaction. Uh, now, number two is impact. It's really, really important for each transaction to have an impact orientation and impact focus uh, because of the development capital within the transaction. However, not all parties within a transaction need to have a focus um, or, a, or a North Star that is oriented towards achieving development impact. Uh, and number three is return. Uh, inherent in the definition of blended finance is mobilizing the private sector if you want to mobilize the private sector, you have to provide them in some sort of financial return. Uh, and hence, blended finance works well when you have business models uh, that have an underlying cash flow that can pay back an investor over time. So financial return, really, really critical. Now, uh, one of the SDGs that aligns itself uh, well with blended finance is SDG 17, as we saw earlier, uh, partnerships for the goal. And that is because blended finance is essentially the coming together of various different stakeholders by through aligning incentives and participating in a transaction. And as you can see from your screen, there are various different stakeholder groups across the continuum of capital uh, that are active and present uh, in this particular ecosystem. Now, <clears throat> If we look at the different kinds and forms of funding, whether it is aid, philanthropy, CSR on one spectrum, uh, impact and social investors, and for the, sake of, uh, for the sake of simplicity, let's group family offices here, and even pure commercial investment on, on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, what blended finance does a very neat job of, and it combines all these various disparate forms of funding, each of them, as you can see, with their own unique characteristic incentives and trade-offs, and brings them all together into one particular structure where each of these actors, participants, or stakeholders takes on a risk return profile that's acceptable to them while achieving their own objectives. So commercial investors achieving alpha, aid, philanthropy, and CSR uh, achieving a development impact, and impact and social uh, investors in the, in the middle of the spectrum uh, achieving a, a blend of, of both those two characteristics. Now, blended finance cannot only be thought of as something that takes place uh, at a point in time, but also something that takes place uh, across time. So if you think about a social enterprise across the life cycle of the organization or an independent power project um, across the life cycle of a particular, of the particular project, um, as you can imagine, a lot of risk takes place or, or, or is sort of front loaded right at the outset of a particular transaction or project. And that is really where we need 
most of the concessional capital coming right up front to take off some of this risk from the table, whether it's proving a concept out or a feasibility, for example, because ideally what we would like is for transactions to take place purely on a commercial basis, but that doesn't happen in the world we live in. And so if you think about this from the perspective of the continuum of capital, most of the risk is right at the outset, which is where you need most of the concessionality being deployed. And I'd urge you all to remember this particular slide because when we speak about where CSR and family offices can play a role um, a little bit later on in the discussion, I will come back to this particular graphic. Uh, next slide, please. Now there are various different flavors or shapes that these particular transactions take. Um, and these are some common blended finance archetypes. And it's important for us to remember that these archetypes do not all live in silos. Many transactions that we come across all have a combination of one or two or three of these particular archetypes. So you could have uh, design or preparation funding, which is purely a grant-based approach, wherein uh, a funder, um, whether it could be a CSR funder or a foundation, or indeed even a donor agency, uh, can come in right at the outset uh, of a particular transaction uh, to provide a grant for a proof of concept or a feasibility to really build out a pipeline um, or to prove out a particular business model uh, such that uh, the transaction it has a feasibility and can go on to raise additional private investment a little bit later on in the life cycle, if you remember the graphic that I showed you earlier. Um, you could also have technical assistance, again, deployed in the form of a grant, which sits outside a capital structure. And really what it does is it helps to build the capacity of an investee or a particular project, um, thereby trying to reduce risk um, and helping to mitigate uh, some of the, the, the risks that private investors face in a transaction. You could also think about this in the context of results-based financing. You've probably all heard of uh, social impact bonds or development impact bonds. Um, our colleagues at the British Asian Trust are, are pioneers uh, in, in putting this structure together, um, particularly in the Quality India Education Bib. Um, and results-based finance is another way of, of thinking about uh, mobilizing uh, private capital through deploying um, some sort of uh, risk mitigation and, and in concessional capital uh, within the context of a transaction. Um, blended finance can also take the shape of a guarantee, which really is powerful because it helps to reduce the gap between the perception of risk and the reality of risk. Uh, and a guarantee is something is, uh, that's also um, very, very powerful in terms of mobilizing uh, the private sector that's also sitting on the sidelines. But the most common flavor uh, of blending is, is deploying concessional debt or equity within the capital structure of a particular transaction, because what that does is it helps to reduce or to alter uh, the risk return ratio or trade-off for those private investors that are contemplating participating in a particular transaction. So we see transactions where you have concessional debt or equity within the capital structure, technical assistance sitting outside the capital structure, and also some transactions that have been provided with this design or preparation funding right at the outset to test out or prove out this particular concept or a combination of these particular flavors and types. Um, next slide, please. Uh, let me give you an example of how some of this uh, comes to light. Um, this is an example from a transaction um, from an organization based in San Francisco. It's called MCE Social Capital. Um, and this transaction is purely focused on providing additional private investment or private financing uh, to microfinance institutions and small and growing businesses, uh, both of whom have an acute uh, need for additional financing. So what MCE really does is uh, it has a social uh, guarantor notes program where it, wherein it goes to a range of different family offices, high net worth individuals, foundations, uh, and other organizations, and it leverages their balance sheet. So essentially what, what it goes and tells them is, you have your investments that are, that are ongoing. Uh, you can provide us with a guarantee that is backstopped by your investments. So the guarantee is only applicable uh, when the guarantee is called or when the portfolio actually defaults. So we leverage your balance sheet, we'll take a guarantee from you. We will take that guarantee to the bank we will um, borrow funds from the bank, essentially using your guarantee as a backstop um, because the banks would not be able to provide us or lend to us 
if we did not have this guarantee as a backstop. And in turn, we will on lend to microfinance institutions and small and growing businesses. So if you're a family office, office, you might have certain investments that are deployed. This is a great way of leveraging your balance sheet and layering on an additional uh, element of impact to the work that you're doing uh, if you're a family office. And I wanted to give, provide this example because I think it's very, very timely uh, for the discussion that we're having here. And um, the lenders are providing capital to MCE that they would not have been able to provide otherwise if it wasn't for these family offices or high net worth individuals that were providing a guarantee and leveraging uh, their balance sheet uh, to create additional development impact. Uh, next slide, please, Shreya. Now, within the context of India, as Salim mentioned, we're seeing a lot of activity, or we have seen a lot of activity to date. If we compare it to, to the rest of the ecosystem, we've seen around 86 transactions in India uh, reach financial close that have been blended over time. This compares to around 600 odd transactions across the entire ecosystem that Convergence is keeping, keeping a track of. Um, all the transactions to date in India have mobilized around an additional financing of around $9 billion. That compares to around $160, $160 billion uh, across, the, across the entire world to date. So again, that's a sizable amount um, from the perspective of India. So a lot of activity taking place uh, in the country till, till date. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and if you look at the sectors uh, to where most of these transactions flow, um, SME financing, energy, uh, agriculture is where we have seen uh, most of the activity to date. And that is because of what I mentioned earlier. Blended finance works well and does well when you have um, transactions or you have uh, sectors that have business models that can pay back investors over time. Uh, it does not work well where you have sectors that do not have those business models um, that have those cash flows that can pay back investors over time. So even if you think about climate finance, this works well in the context of, or has worked well in the context of mitigation, but not so well in the context of adaptation. Of course, there is um, a lot of proving and testing that you can do in the context of adaptation, um, but this is just based on what has happened to date. Uh, and if you look at uh, all the transactions uh, from the India context, most of them have been deployed uh, in the context of fund structures, some of them directly into the company, into the capital stack of a company. But we've also seen this uh, take place in the context of an impact bond or projects or a plain vanilla bond or a facility as well. Uh, and the last slide, if you can add that up, please. Uh, and if you look at, no, the next one, please. Uh, and if you look at it from the perspective of proportion of investments into all India deals, who are the various uh, actors in the India context? You'll see MDBs, DFIs are quite active commercial investors, foundations and NGOs, impact investors, which is where we also see family offices playing a role. Um, and on the right-hand side, if you look at all the commercial investors uh, that have been active in the India context, 27% um, financial institutions, uh, you know, 17 to 18% institutional investors like pension fund insurance companies. And we also have activity from private equity firms, uh, venture capital, uh, amongst others. So I'll stop here. Hopefully that's given you some context around what we're speaking about, um, some statistics uh, from an India context, and I think that will be very, very helpful uh, to allude to uh, as we move into the discussion and Q&A section of this particular uh, panel. Um, so back to you, Salim. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Akif. That was, that was extremely insightful. Uh, I've, I've just, you know, just for the benefit of our listeners, uh, you know, just um, housekeeping, if I'm sure there are loads of questions. If you have any questions, do add them onto the chat box. We will try our best to pick up as many questions as possible and definitely answer them before we've completed the session. Uh, I've taken some very quick notes from what Ben Arkif was presenting. Firstly, I think the I was trying to look for alignment of priorities of CSR and family offices. So the SDG alignment, which is a key aspect of uh, uh, any uh, decisions that CSR, uh, you know, funders take today, or for family offices to come in, is 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 there. Besides that, uh, the room for various type of capital. So uh, and 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 it, that includes uh, grants, which you know can come in to support blended structures as technical assistance. 
and also concessional debt and equity, which requires a certain amount of flexibility, you know, bring in. So, uh, so that that sets context, and I'm hoping you know everyone has a better understanding of at least globally what is happening, what is the opportunity for India, and and I'd like to now you know move to the panelists, and I can see uh, Mr. Saxena has joined us as well. Uh, uh, Mr. Saxena, I, I you know from getting an overall global perspective on blended finance from Arkiv, uh, I want to get some insights you know of what's happening locally, if you could provide some insights on uh, JSW's journey uh, and the potential need for CSR to move beyond traditional grant making. And, and if you can also tell us what are the opportunities and trends in the market right now that other funders should perhaps take notice of. I hope I'm audible, uh, Salim. Yes. yes, we can hear you. Uh, so, sorry for uh, joining a few minutes late because it was inevitable. Uh, interesting. It was good to listen to Akif and you know get reminded of a lot of such instruments on which I I think worked in the past as well. So it was good to hear about credit guarantee and all. Uh, JSW Foundation, if I speak of in um, particular, has been an organization of many firsts. Uh, you know, being a first mover into a number of things. Uh, 2003, 2004 was I think the first time when the vocational training centers were set up. Uh, CSR that those days never used to talk about skill development in such a big uh, you know, uh, manner. Uh, one of the first women's rural BPOs was set up by us in 2005, 2008, uh, you know, mobilizing youth for, uh, uh, you know, skill development. I think that was one of the biggest uh, things, you know, which was always there, uh, very much tagged to the uh, entrepreneurial zeal that the group seems to possess as a, as a, as a part of its DNA. And I think as, as over a period of time, our uh, programs have scaled up, our you know, uh, budgets have also you know, gone up and our footprint per se across the country has gone up. We have been, you know, I would say, uh, been realizing that there is a lot more that can be done in terms of uh, you know, uh, bringing in that right kind of uh, you know, rigor. And you know, I mean, we were never a grant making institution for sure, but being more hands-on, you know, in terms of how more capacity building, more, uh, you know, uh, innovation uh, can be brought in. And I think uh, you are testimony to that, that, you know, the first skill and backbone is going to be nurtured, hopefully launched very soon by all of us. So I think that was one thing. So, you know, so the, what I'm trying to build upon is that through skill development way back in 2001, 2003, 2004, uh, in 2020, 21, you know, the, the, it was to you know do something more to you know enable the ecosystem, and that's where the leveraging of funds comes in. That's where the concept of blending finance, blended finance or you know outcoming outcome funding you know kind of becomes important. Uh, if you uh, uh, recall, I'm sure many of you who are from the development space would recall that one of the first mutual credit guarantee schemes were you know formulated somewhere in 1998 99. I think Unido and Sidbi, I was a part of Unido that time. And Sidbi and Unido had done their first MCGF program, which was later on then taken up by uh, Government of India as well. Uh, so uh, I will touch upon it at a later stage, but you know, uh, it would be sufficient enough to right now say that blended finance in terms of its operational challenges or strategic challenges, I think one was very rightly pointed out by Akiv that it would be, you know, amenable only to models where there is a business behind it. There is going to be a payback, but even for MCGF kind of programs, where the whole idea was to make sure that the credit worthiness of MSMEs is ensured by putting in some kind of a collateral, uh, interest-free collateral uh, by Unido and Sidbi, kind of taking care of the retail part of it. It worked as a good model, but later on, I think it did face some challenges when it came to scaling up. Because I think the key element in there, in that credit worthiness is the element of trust, the trust between the banker and the MSME. And since it's a mutual credit guarantee where the collateral itself is not just being brought in by uh, one, uh, uh, you know, I would say a balance sheet, but is also being brought in by the contributions made by the MSMEs themselves, the mutual trust amongst themselves also plays a very significant role in ensuring that the credit worthiness and the payback of those loans is kind of ensured. So I think 
that's that's one element you know which i think uh, we may delve upon a little bit more but looking at uh, the overall space in which uh, innovation and scale needs to be looked at through csr uh, the disconnect which is still existing between the grassroots level innovations and the scale i think this would become a very important you know aspect very important area uh, in which all of us would have to you know uh, contribute and collaborate with um, and which would require a whole range of financial models if i may say so so we are working right now on, on some of those concepts uh, uh, we are looking at a whole range of social enterprise support and fellowships which surely would be you know uh, about looking at how blended finance can be brought in uh, if i may say uh, one one key uh, potential uh, space which needs to be nurtured and which needs to be explored a bit more by the policy makers as well as you know corporate foundations like ours is the the regulatory silos that seem to be existing because when you're talking about uh, when you're talking about um, blended finance you're like i think akif you know in his presentation very nicely uh, captured the whole flow as to how you know it has to become more concessional and later on more market oriented at a at a certain spectrum of the whole financing model so so where does this silo kind of gets broken i think that's one key challenge which we'll have to delve a little bit more um globally uh, csr is synonymous to shared value uh, i mean a lot of uh, work is happening around shared value concepts uh, of course shared value also would have its own limitations like the blended finance models but per se for csr organizations shared value itself is right now not uh in a sense approved by the uh, the csr laws the regulations that somebody faces and so i think together we'll have to think about where philanthropic funding uh, can play that role where csr funds can you know take certain uh, measurements and then you know create that enabling environment for commercial sector lending to start happening um, so this is one uh in terms of operational or strategic challenge uh, i would say opportunities that exist i think you proven uh, that in education space also blended finance is a model that can be explored skill development we are working very closely on how the whole rules of the con uh, or the concept of skill development needs to be you know re looked at so that the whole ecosystem around skill development in the country changes and ge gears more from training towards more placement and retention i think that's the key impact or, or the social impact that we're looking at one big pitfall that i foresee in purely msme financing or financing blended financing only around economic activities is that i think one direction that we need to take as uh, you know uh, co uh, you know partners in the space is that how economic growth economic development is also being tagged along with certain kind of social indicators that we need to be you know be emphasizing upon because if your msme economic growth is the only key uh then perhaps uh, the blended finance models will you know move veer more towards the commercial way of lending and i think that somehow will not uh you know uh, take it to the to that level so i'll i'll stop at this moment right now uh, i'll i'll be happy to you know contribute more as we move ahead in the discussions thank you so thank much. thank you thank you mr saksan and you know uh, absolutely you know hear you when you make the case for innovation and scale that csr needs to think to support you know going forward and also uh, really really glad to note that you know while there are fair amount of regulatory constraints and i can see a lot of questions around that on what csr capital can or can't do you know within the allowable you know limit or the framework that is defined by the regulation it's great to note that you are still exploring a range of you know different models that you could explore to come in because there is there has to be you know a uh, a uh, 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 csr funders who come and also support innovation in this space and 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 i absolutely second you when you say that and i'm i'm going to hold that thought on you know uh, concessional and flexible capital because i want to bring somya in you know to talk to that because you know we have heard you about the pitfalls we've heard about the regulatory silos that you made a strong case of i'm hoping you know somya comes and gives us a sense of how philanthropic capital which is flexible is perhaps you know going to help solve for that but can i can i just you know i want to move to neha 
you know, who's representing Bank of America. It's it's basically an organization uh, which supports a lot of innovation, you know, globally and has both global and domestic experience in fin uh, blended finance. Uh, Neha, we know that Bank of America has been a leader uh, in this space globally. Uh, it'd be great to hear about some learning from Bank of America's work globally in blended finance. And how do you see banks and financial institutions specifically playing a role in using catalytic financing for meeting SDGs, especially in developing countries like India? Sure, Salim. Thank you for having us here. Uh, I'll answer your second question first. So I think the whole focus for Bank of America on responsible growth is based on the rationale that banks and financial institutions can and need to play a role you know, in uh, helping the world transition to a low carbon economy, uh, moving along inclusive development goals. So we have actually got a sustainable finance group that looks at all eight of our lines of businesses, uh, mobilizing and deploying more capital along the 17 SDGs. Uh, so we have a commitment on the commercial front to deploy about $1.5 trillion by 2030. We've already pumped in about, I would say, $2 billion in philanthropy from 2009 on various areas that are aligned to the SDGs. But I think sitting between these two is an interesting uh, pool of capital that we have, which is the blended finance catalyst pool, where we, uh, we've set aside about $60 million initially to look at investments in four areas, uh, not limited to these four areas, but primarily at these four areas, which is uh, energy access, affordable housing, climate resiliency, and wash, water sanitation, hygiene. We've had some fairly um, good uh, experiences. It hasn't been easy, you know, to find uh, the right collaborations, to find the right partners, to find the right uh, deal pipeline, as it were. But I think our focus through this fund, um, through this pool, has really been to use our funding as a catalyst to pull in, to crowd in other funding, right? So we wouldn't go in as, uh, say, a first loss guarantor because that's pure play philanthropy and that's grant money. We do have expectation of preserving capital, uh, but we are also not looking at market, you know, based returns. Uh, nor are we looking at a senior role where, you know, our investment is de-risked de by others. So more of a junior mezzanine kind of uh, participation where our money pulls in more money and, you know, a leverage of say about 10x is something that we're looking at. We've had some success, like I said, uh, in affordable housing. We've made some investments in the US. We have uh, any energy access, solar, clean power funds. Uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa, for South Asia, uh, in microfinance, for microinsurance, for MSMEs, uh, you know, across uh, the world. So these are some of the experiments that we've done. We've been successful and closed, you know, some of these deals. So we look to build on this uh, globally, locally. Of course, given uh, the need, I think majority of this funding is going to be deployed in developing markets which is what we're seeing even in you know, the kind of deals that we've done so far. India, of course, is a big market. We are open, we are exploring you know, the various models, whether it is through this particular blended uh, capital pool, or even like you said, you know, using CSR funding locally available with working within the constraints of whatever the policy recommendations are. So that's where we are at at Bank of America. Thank you, thanks Neha. I've noted the point that you make that the focus continues to be on developing economies and India is right in the center, uh, specifically around how to use catalytic financing. And of course, CSR continues to be a big opportunity. And we'll come back for some more thoughts, uh, Neha, to you. I'd like to move to Soumya. Uh, uh, Soumya, we've noted that philanthropic capital will play a key role in driving India's longer term social development agenda. And family offices will help channelize that change. Uh, can you tell us a little more about what are the motivations of family offices and how have they evolved over the last few years? Can you give us some examples of approaches that you've used under your know, innovative finance work and how is it playing out in an Indian market context specifically? Um, thank you, Salim, and a pleasure to be addressing all of you uh, today and talking about our experience 
um, as a multifamily office. Um, so I think the first really around what is the motivation for a family office to even participate in this space really stems from the fact that family offices are created when very successful entrepreneurs have actually uh, created a significant amount of liquidity for themselves. So there is this motivation at the back of their minds that how can I give back to society? How can I give back to specific spaces which I personally identify with? And that's really where we see much of their thinking around uh, giving back. Um, the second is also that more and more families are getting far more conscious that their wealth needs to have a purpose. It's not enough for just to be generating commercial returns, but over the longer term, because they view it as a legacy and they view themselves as being custodians of that, custodians of that wealth, they kind of want to make sure that the way in which they're thinking about their wealth is really generational and long-term. So the motivation very much is driven first by you know, being very successful, having the liquidity, wanting to give back to society and really creating a kind of legacy um, for, the next, uh, for, uh, for the next foreseeable future. Also driven very much by the next gen as well uh, in their families who have far more focus on the impact that they're making than otherwise. Um, what we did see when we started looking a little bit more about into the area of blended finance was that it's still a very, very misunderstood and not well understood concept in family offices. There is still a lot of ambiguity because they confuse it with being an impact investor, whereas it is a much wider umbrella, the impact investment is just within that. Um, it also then in some ways fits in quite nicely to a study that Waterfield actually recently has just concluded by bringing out a report next, uh, next month, which has been in collaboration with the Impact Investment Council of India, where we saw that there's been a lot of work which has been done on CSR, there's been a lot of work which has been done on grant giving, but hardly any information on how family offices look at impact investments or blended finance. Two interesting insights came there, which I'm happy to share with this audience. One is that uh, of all the family offices that we interviewed, uh, one out of every two family offices is actually an impact investor and makes impact investments, which really means for me to suggest that they could be a fairly important cog in the wheel when you're looking at blended finance going forward, because they will automatically be participating in that. The second, which was not so obvious, but was interesting, was that family offices really look at their capital uh, in a fairly polarized manner. One part of it is very much driven as a commercial investor. The other is very much driven as an impact investor, um, which then means that they don't want to really, and they're very, very wary of impact washing uh, when it comes to their investments on the um, in terms of when they look at, let's say, any kind of blended finance or otherwise that kind of transaction. So one has to be quite clear that how, we, how are we going to approach this with family offices? At Waterfield, what we've done is in the early days, we would always think about it as philanthropic giving. Now we've actually rebranded that to say it is actually capital towards sustainable development. And when you rephrase it and say it's capital towards sustainable development, you can then bring in the entire blended finance piece, and then you can also have a section which is around grants. The beauty of grants is that unlike CSR, doesn't have the restrictions that CSR technically has. It also means that it's much more patient capital. It also means that families are willing to spend that money uh, for let's say first losses on or concessional debt, which they can give. It also means that they're in a position um, to actually free this, uh, allocate that capital with really no expectation of return in mind. Um, and that is something that we saw uh, with a lot of families because we would actually work with an intermediary which was actually putting together bond structures for other microfinance institutions. And we found that while it was termed as priority sector lending for many of the banks, family offices came in in terms of junior debt as well as mezzanine. So we've been doing this for some time now. Uh, but the only thing is that we never thought of it as blended finance. It was just something that we said that, look, this seems the right thing to do, and therefore we're going to work on uh, to, towards this basis. The interesting thing, though, for me now is that when I look at allocations for clients today, and we say that this is sustainable development capital, 
and we look at blended finance and we look at grant giving. In the blended finance piece, what I see is that you may find family offices behaving both as the commercial investor as well as the um, as well as the impact investor. So I wouldn't want to just kind of pigeonhole family offices to say we're just going to be sitting in the uh, impact investor space because I think what the Indian family office is looking like is really to be able to participate in both. And then you come to the entire product stream, which is today, I think, still very restricted. We haven't really seen much more than a handful of maybe development impact bonds or social impact bonds. And we've also then seen a couple of pool vehicle structures which have come in where uh, family offices have had to participate. So for us, uh, it's really around, you know, just the awareness of what's going on. And also we really don't see too many or enough products. But fundamentally, we're trying to get uh, family offices to think in blended finance more in terms of just sustainable development capital rather than just pure philanthropy giving. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, thanks, Somya. And I've noted the whole transition of the narrative from philanthropy giving to capital towards sustainable development. It's, and it is, it really makes it, uh, the context setting is absolutely different. And just to ask, so I, are you saying is it, is it for the lack of enough opportunities or you know, structures to participate? Is that what the hindrance yes. is right now? I, I, I do think it is. One is that they're just not enough that domestic family offices in India are seen. I think there's a lot of activity which happens from foreign investors and global pools, but very little in terms of the Indian context. And the other is that if you did have a product, do you have enough good advisors to be able to diligence those products or to be able to say that this is the right structure for this family? I think both are really at play uh, because as part of the survey, when we did the survey, uh, we also realized that most reasons why families don't participate is because they say we don't see enough good opportunities in terms of risk reward. So how do we then change that? Um, so I hear you on that. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Samya. I'd, I'd like to go back to uh, Akif. Akif, I know you touched upon this in your presentation, but what really are the big market opportunities for funders like CSR and family offices, and how? And 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 just also, you know, Samya makes a case of you know not really. I mean, the opportunities need to be presented and packaged in a certain way. So how can how can CSR and family offices contribute to the development agenda using blended finance instruments? If you can just pick up from, uh, I know there was a slide in your uh, deck, Afik, Akif, it will be good to hear a little more on that. Yeah, great, thanks, Salim. Uh, I think, Salim, let's take a step back for a second over here and think about this from the perspective of domestic first versus international, because traditionally what we've seen in terms of development capital and blended finance, specifically in the India context, but other geographies as well, is traditionally you've seen the de-risking coming in from uh, international donors, USAID, FCDO, yeah. Australian government, or even the Rockefeller Foundation, the Gates Foundation, and so on. Now these countries, are, these, these institutions are looking at India in many ways, and they're saying India needs to stand on its own two feet. Um, and they're stepping away from this donor donee relationship towards a partnership-based relationship. I think right. we need to recognize that first. This provides an opening um, for Indian CSR agencies and organizations. This provides an opening to, for Indian philanthropists and indeed, indeed uh, Indian family offices as well to come and take the baton from these other agencies um, and to really play the role of mobilizing additional private investment um, that these agencies were doing in the past. So I think, I think that's the first thing yeah. to contextualize. Yeah. Um, the second thing over here, I think, is to take a step back also and understand the business models and the characteristics of CSR versus family office, right? CSR, purely 100% financial trade-off. Uh, as Somia rightly alluded to, family office is a lot more complicated. You have the philanthropy side of the business to some degree. Within the investment side as well, you have the impact investment side, preservation of capital. Um, and then you have the commercial investment, which is looking for in seeking alpha. So you have a lot more nuance to unpack on the family office side of, 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 the, of the equation. Now, if you take both the family offices and CSR and you put them on this continuum of capital that I showed you earlier, um, when, whether it come, when it comes to CSR and family offices philanthropy side, 
it is a huge role for these for these institutions to play to de-risk projects and transactions right at the outset. So let me give you an example. Uh, Convergence is working very closely with a Hong Kong-based family office called the RS Group. The RS Group wants to see more natural capital solutions and transactions in, in this space because they want additional private capital uh, to come on on the backs of these particular projects to be financed. But right now, when it comes to natural capital, business models are not um, streamlined. They're not hard-coded. There's a lot of amorphous understanding about the space. And so this is this, this family office really said to themselves, you know what, we, can, we see our role in terms of getting this money out of the door. Maybe we can structure it from a returnable grant perspective so that we can you know, continue to do this on an evergreen basis. Um, and here we can finance these interesting projects, proof of concept feasibility, so that later on down the line, you'll get additional impact investors that will come into, into the picture, maybe additional commercial investors and so on and so forth. CSR colleagues, family office philanthropy can play a role there. Family office, of course, can also play a role in the impact investment side of the house, right? Where those transactions to some extent have been de-risked at the outset, you come in right at the hybrid of this you know, concessional and commercial capital where you are shepherding a transaction towards a more commercial oriented investor a little bit later on. So you're coming in maybe right at the, the middle section of that continuum of capital that I showed you earlier, where you are trading off some degree of financial return for development impact. And of course, family offices as well also want to achieve alpha. There is no reason why in these transactions they can't, cannot achieve alpha, right? Um, this is not purely a philanthropic or grant based. So you can have family offices also coming much later on in the transaction where they are being de-risked by CSR organizations and philanthropy to some degree. So there's family offices have a lot more versatility in this continuum of capital. CSR, of course, right at the outset. But the unique characteristics is, is that both these, these stakeholder groups are flexible, much more than other agencies and other stakeholders, and they can operate really fast. They have to you know, go to market and speed, uh, yeah. which, is, which is something that they, that they can play with. So I think if you contextualize it in this context, you can really see how family offices and CSR organizations can really play and have an outsized impact in the India context. And I really would like to see a lot more of this happening over time. And I think this, this, this conversation and, and this uh, panel is really timely to that effect. Oh, thanks, thanks, Akif. And I've been <clears throat> reading the chat box for some questions as well. A lot of questions around, you know, uh, uh, what is possible or not possible, and and more so around CSR. You know, I, I read a question which says, can CSR participate in return-linked uh, structures? There was another question of saying, how can uh, how can C, uh, CSR capital, you know, look to support more than just you know doing research grants? So uh, I, I I'd like to come to uh, Mr. Saxena to just. Uh, and I and I know, Mr. Saktana, you made a point on regulatory silos and also fair amount of challenges that need to be navigated through. Could you could you just highlight some of those? What you have you come across? Because at the at the back of those challenges, we've also seen you come and you know participate in structures. So with every, uh, if I may say, uh, a, a regulatory silo or a challenge, also is a is a solution that you know, can be worked out on, you know, some things that you can do and make the regulation work really. So do you want to talk a bit about the challenges that you've come across, especially we just, I mean, which are unique to India, the work that you do in India? Be good to hear on that. Thanks, Salim. <clears throat> no, I think as, as you have problems, you also have the solutions. So I'm, I'm sure, you know, the way we, we are structuring uh, with the support from your office and Nishit Desai, uh, how we are structuring that social impact bond for skill development. I think that itself is a good example of how CSR funds can be brought in into a multi-stakeholder you know, framework, uh, which is purely an impact investment. And impact investments through CSR, I don't think so that too many organizations, at least in India, are attempting that. Uh, but we've, we've you know, looked at the legal aspect of it and surely it is being done. And I think, uh, I think it's going to pave a way for more such CSR funds to be brought in for impact investing or blended finance in general. Uh, to answer the question that can CSR funds be deployed for any transactions where the invested capital can come back or not, surely you can do that. In fact, uh, 
I, I forgot to mention that JSW as a group, while we have a foundation uh, which I look after, uh, we also have a JSW venture capital uh, investment fund uh, which has been created. And uh, taking a corollary, you know, from the way IFC World Bank Group operates, we are working, we are trying to structure a model where pure, uh, like what Swamya mentioned, you know, bringing in finance uh, to, you know, make, make projects, uh, you know, more uh, amenable to uh, uh, quasi-commercial or more commercial, uh, you know, uh, investments. At, at foundations level, we are operating on all those programs where we believe there is an opportunity for the MSMEs to grow, uh, to invest in certain basic potential of that particular sector to be brought out. Uh, so we are looking at a whole continuum of things to look at solutions. So first is, uh, and, and I'm taking a step back, it's not related to blended finance only, but uh, for CSR organizations, I think the key challenge is that many a times you are in locations where there is not much to be, you know, be banked upon. So people, people do not have the basic wherewithal, you know, to even reach to a bank and take a small little loan. So, so at that continuum, we are working on a program called Hak Darshak, which is ensuring that the basic, you know, rights of, of a citizen are being passed on through the public, you know, schemes to the people because that creates a, you know, space for us to, you know, put our resources where it is more strategically going to be used. So that's level one. Level two, we bring in our resources for, as I said, looking at models, putting in that capital, putting in that resource to make sure that these are workable models try and test them out. Uh, JSW Venture is now, uh, you know, it, it's a pure investment, uh, you know, I would say venture capital uh, fund, but which is now looking at how uh, the proof of concept, if it has been, you know, established, how that can be scaled up. Uh, and between this continuum, we are looking at two models. Uh, one is creating a multi-stakeholder platform where a lot of convergence of resources can be done both of CSR in nature as well as non-CSR in nature as well. The idea being that the CSR, and this is going to also answer the question that you know was raised by you from some participant. CSR can certainly put in money into a non-grant making thing where the return of the capital can also be ensured, but it should not be ploughed back to the business. So this is where I think a foundation kind of an entity comes into picture. So when 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 we as a charitable trust we are operating, we are ensuring that that money which is coming to us for me every JSW company which uh, you know, kind of contributes to my, you know, coffers to my budget. They are not getting that money back. That money, so there's a there's a there's a curtain between us and the uh, the the uh, the, I would say the business company. So the company has given me the CSR funds to you know deploy them. I am deploying those funds, and I am creating a whole mechanism of how revolving funds can be created. Yeah. So there was this concept of trust funds in you know. Uh, IFC, where a lot of donors could come and put their funds for a particular cause, for a particular, you know, uh, thing that they would like to, uh, you know, uh, be just using that money only for that particular project, for that particular uh, proof. So that's the direction that we are trying to, you know, nurture. And for sure, there is no harm in creating those flexible mechanisms, the new rules that have come uh, since January this year. They do provide that multi-year planning and, you know, flexibly using the funds over the next three years, which I think gives a sufficient amount of window of opportunity for us to look at these kind of structures. The key challenge is uh, putting in the funds, taking it to a certain level, but beyond that, uh, then it requires, you know, uh, the next level of funding. So you may put in some, uh, I would say, patient's capital in the beginning, but then it requires, you know, like a grassroots uh, level funding, then it would require a, you know, a, a mix of grant plus loan component. I think those structures are still, you know, uh, which need to be taken, you know, but yes, uh, a lot more can be achieved if we could be looking at concepts of, you know, how uh, the company itself can utilize some of its own resources, not just financial, but non-financial resources as well for creating this ecosystem. So we are, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, from our experience, what we are saying is, A, creating that platform for getting these operational things in place uh, through fellowships, through, you know, creating these pots of, you know, I would say uh, funds of uh, money by, you know, putting resources on programs which can be taken care of and they reach to a certain scale where 
they would be am amenable for you know for the funding or loans from commercial banks i think that's that's the direction that csr needs to take and that's that's i think where the possibility also lies thanks thanks mr saxena and, and I'm, i'm hearing you on the challenge on sustainability of some of the you know programs that get started but longer term sustenance are some of those answers there on the social social stock exchange and i'm reading some questions in in the chat box and this is for mr saxena or anyone else on the panel as well i mean how are we looking at the social stock exchange to be a platform to one list some of these opportunities because we heard somya say i think it's about the lack of certain opportunity is there also for it to be due diligence placed somewhere and also for uh, uh, partners on the ground to come and also participate apply for some of those uh, you know grants or you know capital sort of use it it'll be good to just hear some perspective on that as well mr sir either either from you or anyone else on the panel Sorry. yeah yeah now salim i uh, i would say it's at a nascent stage right now you know when yeah. when the cb uh, stock exchange that is you know being talked of at this moment you know uh, i'll be very candid most discussion is around uh, you know the compliance of that 2% thing yeah. and if i have not been able to do can i can i use the social stock exchange for getting getting away from that i think that that is usually the direction right now which is happening um so i would stop at just saying that it is still at a very nascent stage i think uh, many sure. have not been fully understanding it that how this can be you know this framework can be utilized in a better way uh, uh, i think what what could be ideal is that where uh, the blending of various uh, you know impacts that you are envisaging that can be clubbed because my own experience is telling me by every passing day that the more integrated your approach is uh, better are the outcomes especially the social outcomes okay. so while you are while you are supporting an msme uh, through a blended finance model are you also ensuring that you are looking at the other aspects the other dimensions of that msme uh, if not then i think you know you are just getting lesser buck for your uh, lesser bang for your buck so i think that is the direction where uh, this this model perhaps would be useful sure thanks i think so and i'm going back to your earlier so, points but i sorry yeah if i could come in salim yes, please, i please, i sorry. am personally very excited about the social um social sector exchange that's going to come up because i think we've all been waiting for this the fact that sebi has actually approved this at their recent board meeting um which was just at the end of last month means that particularly for investors um and family office capital we are then in a position to actually look at transactions see transactions see not for profits be able to invest in them diligence them and know that even before they get listed on the exchange there would have been a process which they've gone through in terms of due diligence and audit which then i think makes it very very interesting for uh, the social sector so personally sitting where i do as somebody who's investing capital for family offices uh really something that we're looking forward to in a very big way absolutely and it it clearly and of course as mr saxena said it's still sort of getting thought about but the fact that you said you know today if there's anything that was constraining philanthropic capital to come into structures like this it was also for the lack of a credible platform so if you have someone like a social stock exchange backed by the government due diligence before anything is listed i think should get the much required comfort to uh apply private philanthropists to come and participate in these and so i may i want to come to you now on uh the discussion around uh, uh you know the opportunities so the challenges of csr or the constraints of csr are the opportunities you know for the family office capital especially the flexibility that that capital brings and also uh is there perhaps a potential of blending csr and uh philanthropic capital so csr does uh you know what it can and whatever are the constraints on csr perhaps philanthropic capital blends and and is applied for doing that uh, i mean it's just a thought that's occurred it can be it can be great for some of these to marry on a on a transaction in the coming days but so might be great to hear from you on the overall opportunities um I, yes, i'm always very excited about the space so but i will definitely <laughs> say that 
I think we're just so early uh, in terms of the journey right now. Uh, maybe just uh, alluding a little bit to what Akif had mentioned before. Um, the family offices can come in very early. <laughs> it's exactly what you actually saw in the commercial venture um, ecosystem. So typically when a family office invests, they do a lot of seed investing, they do a lot of venture investing as commercial investors. So this actually should not be that different. Um, so their acceptance of coming in early, looking at risk capital as patient capital for the longer term, not really being having some of the, um, the uh, boundaries that you have with CSR, all, is going to, all of these are going to mean that this is really an opportunity that family offices have been secretly kind of, I think, waiting for. Um, and when you have platforms like the, um, like the social stock exchange, or you have the fact that we can get in very early in terms of investing, uh, these are really the opportunities that are there. What I think I'd love to see, which is probably what family offices will also try to do, is really the rigor that we've seen on the CSR side. How much of that in terms of just measuring for impact, seeing what is it that we're really doing, diligencing opportunities better, seeing opportunities which are more transactional in nature rather than just you know, doing everything based on heart. A lot of it has to also be based yeah. on the head in terms of you know, why is this investment relevant or not? I think some of that, uh, if we start seeing within the uh, family office side, I think would be wonderful for the ecosystem. And really to Ashwini's point, it's about collaboration. Ultimately, can CSR money, can family office money, can they all play that critical role? Uh, can development agencies play that, uh, play that role as well to come in to provide some of that buffer for early investing into really spaces that can make an impact going forward? So for me, very exciting times. Challenges are many, but I think the opportunity far outweigh uh, what is it that uh, for a country like India really needs. Sure, and you made a strong point on collaboration, Soumya. And if there's anything that, you know, uh, the past transaction, especially, you know, uh, 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 impact bonds that have been, you know, successfully launched, it's it's been all about successful collaboration and common shared values. So uh, I totally hear you on that. And you did mention, you know, the need for impact measurement as well. I want to come to you, Neha. The CSR regulations in India have been undergoing a lot of changes. And the more recent ones, that mandate for spends to be incurred in the same year, there are tighter requirements around measurement and evaluation. Are these changes posing constraints? Uh, and will this limit the role of blended finance structures in the growing market? No, on the contrary, I think it will be better for the industry because the focus Absolutely. on outcome, measuring outcomes is very important. If anything, uh, you know, philanthropy, whether it is CSR or family offices, it has a high risk taking capacity, right? Uh, even within that, at least from our experience, I can talk that we have been measuring our impact. And I don't use the word impact very loosely over here. I actually mean monitoring over a certain period of time, you know, uh, what has actually happened with your interventions on the ground, right? Whether it is, uh, and there is not one particular uh, indicator or parameter that you would move, right? Any intervention has multiple uh, impact points. Uh, to be able to measure that and to translate that into a language that investors would understand, I think is very important. Uh, for us, it's not going to be a steep learning curve because we've been doing it even before it was mandated. We have a third party uh, you know, partner who's been monitoring. I think it is very, whether you use the term blended finance, you use the term, uh, you know, patient capital impact is when investing, we have been using our own CSR funding in a manner that mimics these, uh, you know, structures. So whether you're talking about focus on certain kinds of models, uh, you know, focusing on certain outcomes, focus on gender, gender poverty, for example, you know, all of these things has been built into our strategy and monitoring and measuring has definitely helped move that along. So I would think it's a good thing. Great, and I and I hear you make a strong case for uh, result-based structures there and the need for measurement and all of that is what blended finance, you know, structures bring to the table. Uh, uh, 
I I want to move to Akif for my next question, but also keep this question open for other panelists. So I want to hear about the role of uh, governments. Uh, what is the role that governments can play in blended finance structures? You know, definitely because we know that the issues of scale and sustainability can only be solved for with the participation of the government. So Akif, you are able to if you are able to give us some examples from a global experience how government has come in. And I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Saxena, Neha, and Soumya would uh, be able to add a bit on the role of governments in India, really, and what it would mean for us. But Akif, a global perspective would be great first. Sure, Salim. And before that, if you may permit me, I'll just, you know, add to a couple of points that I think Soumya made. Um, and I think that will really benefit the audience. One is, I think there should be a really clear distinction between impact investing and blended finance, because as Soumya said, the two can get conflated. Blended finance is essentially a structuring approach. That's pretty much what it is. It's a financial structuring approach, nothing more, nothing less. Well, as impact investment is an investing thesis or an approach or an hypothesis. So I think hopefully that's right. a very clear difference in the yeah. two. Somi also alluded to a lack of products for family offices, which is I, I definitely second. I, I teach a program um, at the University of Zurich every year, which is, which is targeted uh, for wealth managers um, and advisors of high net worth individuals and family offices, because when the next gen are approaching their, their advisors and family office advisors, not many of them are putting uh, interesting SDG aligned products in front of them. So it's a little bit of designing those products, but also the intermediation between the products and the actual capital needs to be much more, much more streamlined. Um, so Salim, coming to your question around scale, uh, why are we in the business of scale? Why is this really important? Um, according to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, if you want to achieve the SDGs in the developing country context, just in the developing country context and only CapEx, we have a $2.5 trillion, trillion with a T, wow. funding gap. If you combine all the official development assistance globally in the world from the USAID to the Australians to the Japanese, you combine that, that's only $150 billion. A small percentage of that is going to do this scheme. Blended finance every year, according to our data, is only mobilizing roughly $15 billion of additional financing. So there's a massive gap. I'm not talking about its scale because it's a buzzword or because it's a, you know, it's trending, but because this is really the need of the hour. This is what this, there's no other choice for us, right? Um, so that's I think an important context. Now, in the in, in the from the perspective of donors, I think there's two kinds of donors, right? There's there's donor governments and recipient governments, so to speak. When we talk about donor governments, the more the OECD DAC countries, around 30 of them, so only 17 of them are blending programs. And essentially there's two things they can do. They can either de-risk or risk mitigate. And on the other side of the equation, return enhance, right? Because at the end of the day, we need that risk return ratio that's acceptable. Um, when it comes to de-risking, and one you know, model that I will uh, allude to and, and from a global context is there's been a, a consortium of donors coming together. And instead of doing work on a transaction by transaction basis, which is really, you know, there's a big transaction cost, it's not very efficient. Uh, what we've seen is donors come together to capitalize multi-donor initiatives that can then that have a strong balance sheet that can then go out and be de-risking agencies in and of themselves. In the infrastructure space, you have something known as the private infrastructure development group, big group of donors coming together to de-risk projects. Currency risk, big, big problem in this space as well. A bunch of donors have come together to set up an organization called the Currency Exchange. Again, balance sheets backed by donor country capital. Um, in the context of providing additional financing to SMEs in Africa, a group of donors, including the Danes um, and others, have come together to set up the African Guarantee Fund. Instead of providing guarantees on an individual project by project basis, they've come to set up an institution that can then go on to provide guarantees uh, to these organizations. Now on the recipient, or I guess on the Global South perspective, um, again, there's two you know, kinds of governments as well. There's governments that have resources, the governments that don't have resources. On the governments that, you know, that are resource constrained, um, you, know, you can really focus on building a pipeline, curating a pipeline of transaction, but also regulatory reform, really, really important. Because as I mentioned, blended finance will only work well when you have uh, business models that can pay back investors over time, but also some sort of stable regulatory environment as well, which, which you know, these, these transaction structures do not solve for, cannot solve for. Um, but on the, um, 
on the second part of the recipient government perspective, where you have recipient governments that have the means, such as, for example, India, Indonesia, um, we have seen governments, ca again, capitalizing institutions that can then provide the relief scheme themselves. So, for example, in Indonesia, um, there's an organization called the Indonesia Infrastructure Guarantee Fund, which has been capitalized by the Indonesian government that then goes on and provides de-risking and or, or risk mitigation tools or credit announcement tools to investors for them to you know, comfortably invest in Indonesia's infrastructure ambitions and plans. Um, let's talk about it from the perspective of India. Um, you perhaps all have heard of this Utkrish development impact bond um, in the health sector in Rajasthan that was initially seeded um, by a Convergences grant funding program, which was again, it's a flow through grant from the Canadian government, but it could be a flow through grant from any other institution, right? Um, and the idea is very much in the initial phase, you have, um, I believe uh, it was, um, um, you have, uh, I think USAID um, as an outcomes funder along with Merck's for Mothers. But in the second uh, iteration of this particular development impact bond, the ambition is very much to have the Rajasthan government serve as the outcomes funder. And once the Rajasthan government is comfortable with this innovative finance topic or idea, they can really take on this and scale it because development impact bonds, social impact bonds are great, but they're great from the perspective of trialing and testing innovation. I mean, look at educated girls, same thing, same, same concept, right? They've tried and tested something, it worked really well, and then they've tried to scale it from the perspective of grounds. So I think, I think uh, governments can, can, can have, a, have a huge role to play, but it really depends on what kind of government we're talking about. Um, and of course, scale is really, really important. And I, and I do urge everyone to think about scale rather than doing transactions on an individual basis because transaction costs are too high and we really don't have the time until 2030 to wait for this. Uh, agree, agree, absolutely, Ashif and, uh, and also I think, you know, the lack of evidence right now currently in India for, you know, governments to support some of these innovations. And we've seen that transition happening and hopefully as uh, Mr. Saxena was saying uh, in the next, uh, impact bond around skilling. Perhaps the whole motivation to go into that is to create evidence to take then to the government to really influence the way skilling interventions are taken. And yes, Akif. Okay. And Salim, just uh, coming back to governments, traditionally, when they look at development, international development, it's traditionally been on a purely grant basis. And that's how these development agencies have been staffed. Now, when you're talking to them about mobilizing the private sector or working with the private sector, it, it requires a different skill set, a different lexicon, different yeah. frameworks and different tools. So even building capacity of governments in the global north and even in the global south is really important. Providing evidence because we want them to be additional. We want private finance to be additional. We don't want to subsidize the private sector. Yeah. We need to think about minimum concessionality as well. So data evidence, case studies, all these are really, really important to build this ecosystem and to build the sector out. Um, and that's also why Convergence was stood up. We are a organization that's been stood up by a range of different global governments um, to build out this particular field. And that's really our mandate. Sure. Mr. Saxena, Neha, Soumya, anything to add? I would just, you know, second to what Akif said, and uh, I'll say it. Uh, in fact, when I gave the example of that MCGF, the whole challenge was that uh, you know, uh, traditionally or typically the way uh, we we in our country first the government makes a big massive scheme, and then it is rolled down on a share between state and the government, uh, central government budgeting, and then it gets disseminated to across all locations, and then you know the the challenge of implementation starts coming in. So it's a it's a it's a big scale planning with with less of micro level detailing and which you know then lends everything into the pitfall. I am again recalling that uh, visual credit guarantee scheme which was launched uh, you know in a small little pilot in uh, Rajasthan I remember, and then it was scaled up very very fast and turned into a retail product which again I in my personal opinion misfired. So, so I think one key challenge with the government is that it wants to scale up anything and everything that comes up. And uh, unfortunately, development space is so much nuanced and contextual that what may work in a diverse country like India, especially what may work in southern part of the country may not at all work in the eastern part of the country and so on and so forth. So I think this uh, 
there is a whole emphasis on decentralized planning the public public policy makers are also now talking about it I, i've been you know a little provocative by saying this i think the developmental engines have to be changed the developmental engines cannot be the governments the developmental engines have to be the development institutions or if i may say so corporates uh, because we are there for perpetuity if we have set up a steel plant we are there for 40 50 years uh, we would be you know uh, very much it, it would be in our business interest to ensure that things go exactly in the right manner and so therefore rather than you know contributing to a government scheme planned at somewhere you know without knowing the nuances it's more important that the convergence starts happening at the local level uh, and from there you know you evolve models uh, which are then possibly replicable at different locations i mean uh, public health programs the way we have been working across so many states i can tell you each location within one state has got something different to do about it so so i think government can play a significant role but government can play that role by supporting it but not scaling it without fully thinking about it i mean that's the biggest pitfall that i think we we need to avoid i don't know whether somebody agrees with me on this or not but my feeling is that too big a scale also sometimes creates its own problems and then what happens is the whole concept itself gets gets lost because the concept has been tested tried at so many places out of some places it worked some places it didn't work so the so, so the places where it didn't work the whole cynicism around that concept starts you know evolving i think i would stop there so sure. and perhaps a room for public private partnerships right so you know public money partnering with private capital trying something new challenging some of the existing exactly. you know structures etc making a case putting out evidence and then carrying yeah. forward i think the skill impact bond selling that we are nurturing is exactly the same absolutely absolutely and akif i know you you are a comment in that selling quick quick thing about public private partnerships again because definitions are important is you know inherently public private partnership is not blended it's it's it's, it's a it's a contractual approach it's, it's yeah. legally yeah. yeah um public private partnership is only blended when there is a concessional element being brought in by the by the public sector so i just wanted to make sure that's very clear for for all the listeners because all these terms can get really conflated and i yeah. think just going back to first principles is really key yeah. we we do have the opportunities of calling beauty projects as ppp projects <laughs> <laughs> and thank you and i can go on and on with this discussion but the clock is ticking as well i want to we've had a rich discussion but i just uh, want to have the opportunity to ask uh, all of you if you wanted to make quick summarizing comments on this so just just summarizing the discussion just as some takeaways for our listeners and and something which will hopefully uh, you know help build this overall ecosystem with csr and private philanthropic capital really uh, driving the next scale of uh, 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 growth for uh, india's development agenda so can we whom do we start with can we start with you somya i think we've had a really good discussion uh, salim and i think uh, the way i'd look at it is that it's still early days um i think family offices can play a huge role in supporting um the blended finance ecosystem uh but two important areas will be around awareness um investor education um and the other would be around collaboration in terms of the ecosystem so i just leave it with those comments thank you thank you over to you neha thanks salim i think i'm just going to echo what somya said uh, especially on the point on collaboration given that we're talking about blended finance i think collaboration amongst all stakeholders is important it's an exciting time we've seen uh, you know this space really evolve in the past few years so i'm at least excited to see what we can do especially from a csr perspective given you know the restrictions that we still do have and uh, to arkif's point i think our time to market may not be that fast as perceived but we would still like to explore some of these models and see what we can do and i think it would be the next step from what we've been doing in philanthropy as such brilliant thank you uh, mr saxena can i bring you in i would like to end up with a to do for us and that to do should be uh, to build upon what arkif said you know that if if we can have a matrix and it would never be exhaustive for sure 
But if we could come with a matrix which says that this sector, this kind of a program, this is where you know a, a family office funding would be most suitable at this stage. Uh, this is where, and and you can start looking at you know maybe the rubric could be the rule seven activities themselves. So start looking at education, and Salim, we'll be very happy to come and work with you on this. That say for example in this space of education, what are various challenges that we face as development institutions what are those things which are not answerable sometimes and how can blended finance play a certain role there and which kind of an entity would fit well uh, most ideally at at what stage of that continuum you know which akif very beautifully put together in sppt i think if we can start just putting our thoughts around that uh, that itself would become a good beginning point for us to start looking at all these opportunities of collaboration and convergence thank you Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saksara. And, and the final word from you, Akif. So, Salim, I wouldn't, I wouldn't phrase this as the final word. I would phrase it more as a call to action. Um, and I have two calls to action uh, for, for everyone listening. Uh, number one is that we don't have time. We need your capital, CSR capital and family office capital to be brought to the table now. We only have nine years uh, before we need to, to achieve the SDGs. So this is, this is an important you know, problem. And this is something that really, really needs to be thought through now. We don't have too much time for building capacity and awareness. It has to, be, this has to happen now. So that the, the, clock is, the clock is ticking. That's my first call to action. And the second call to action is you have flexibility. You really have the propensity to push the frontiers of risk. And this is why you know, the whole world is looking at India in, in this context. We're one of the few geographies that I can think of that has a very well-resourced domestic sector, but has acute development needs. There are not many other geographies that I can think of that have a combination of these two. So if the family offices and within in the Indian context, Indian high with individuals, and if our CSR organizations and agencies and corporates can get this right, I think we have a template and a model for the rest of the world. Um, and I think that will be something that we can all be really, really proud of. And so this is my challenge to all of you in the next couple of years when we come back and have another discussion. We want to talk about the case study of the of India CSR and family offices to the rest of the world. Um, so that so the time is now the clock is ticking and I think uh, all of you are really have the skill sets and the capital to do what needs to be done. Um, and so so it's over to you to get to work. Brilliant, brilliant. So you said and thanks. I'm just bringing all thoughts together. Our rich domestic sector. Uh, development need, which is clearly highlighted. Uh, we don't have the time, the urgency is now because there are SDG goals to be met, but there is the need for awareness. There is investor education, which is needed. Collaboration was never more urgent than it is now. And the right structuring that needs to be needed. What kind of structures work for which kind of interventions? So clearly, I think it's a great way to summarize on a very positive note. And, and just to add here, I think British Asian Trust is committed to continue to building this ecosystem in India. And we look forward to carrying on with some of these discussions. And, and any other participants, if you have any of your questions that get uh, that went unanswered, do write in to us and we'll be happy to sort of pick that up on the side. But thank you very much. Uh, and, and I thank all the panelists for joining and for all the listeners to come in and listen to this. I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you, everyone.